Chapter forty of the Hand of Fu Manchu This Librivox recording is in the public domain The Hand of Fu Manchu by Sax Romer Chapter forty The Black Chapel of how we achieved that twelve or fifteen yards below the rocky bed of the stream the powers that lent us strength and fortitude alone hold record gasping for breath drenched almost reconciled to the end which i thought was come i found myself standing at the foot of a steep flight of stairs roughly hewn in the living rock beside me the extinguished lamp still grasped in his hand lent kennedy panting wildly and clutching at the uneven wall Sir Lionel Barton had sunk exhausted upon the bottom step, and Nayland Smith was standing near him, looking up the stairs. From an arched doorway at their head, light streamed forth. Immediately behind me, in the dark place where the waters roared, opened a fissure in the rock, and into it poured the miniature cataract. I understood now the phenomenon of minor whirlpools for which the little river above was famous. Such were my impressions of that brief breathing space then— have your pistols ready cried smith leave the lamp kennedy it can serve us no further mustering all the reserve that remained to us we went pell-mell a wild bedraggled company up that ancient stair and poured into the room above one glance showed us that this was indeed the chapel of asmodeus the shrine of satan where the black mass had been sung in the middle ages the stone altar remained together with certain latin inscriptions cut in the wall Fu Manchu's last home in England had been within a temple of his only master. Save for nondescript litter, evidencing a hasty departure of the occupants, and a ship's lantern burning upon the altar, the chapel was unfurnished. Nothing menaced us, but the thunder hollowly crashed far above. To cover his retreat, Fu Manchu had relied upon the noxious host in the passage, and upon the wall of water. Silent, motionless, we four stood looking down at that which lay upon the floor of the unholy place. In a pool of blood was stretched the Eurasian girl's army. Her picturesque finery was reft into tatters, and her bare throat and arms were covered with wheels and bruises occasioned by ruthless, clutching fingers. Of her face, which had been notable for a sort of devilish beauty, I cannot write. It was the awful face of one who had died from strangulation. Beside her, with a melee criss in his heart, a little jewelled weapon that I had often seen in Zarmi's hand, sprawled the obese Greek Samarkan, a member of the C. Fan group and sometime manager of a great London hotel. It was ghastly, it was infinitely horrible, that tragedy of which the story can never be known, never be written, that fiendish fight to the death in the black chapel of Asmodeus. "'We are too late,' said Nayland Smith. "'The stair behind the altar.' He snatched up the lantern. Directly behind the stone altar was a narrow pointed doorway. From the depths with which it communicated proceeded vague, awesome sounds, as of waves breaking in some vast cavern. We were more than halfway down the stair when, above the muffled roaring of the thunder, I distinctly heard the voice of Dr. Fu Manchu. "'My God!' shouted Smith. "'Perhaps they are trapped!' The cave is only navigable at low tide and in calm weather. We literally fell down the remaining steps and were almost precipitated into the water. The light of the lantern showed a lofty cavern tapering away to a point at its remote end, pear fashion. The throbbing of an engine and churning of a screw became audible. There was a faint smell of petrol. Shoot! Shoot! The frenzied voice was that of Sir Lionel. Look! They could just get through! Crack! Crack! crack nayland smith's browning spat death across the cave then followed the report of barton's pistol then those of mine and kennedy's a small motor-boat was creeping cautiously out under a low natural archway which evidently gave access to the sea since the tide was incoming a few minutes more of delay had rendered the passage of the cavern impossible the boat disappeared we are not beaten snapped nayland smith the Chanak Campbell will be seized in the channel. There were formerly steps in the side of the well from which this place takes its name, declared Nayland Smith dully. This was the means of access to the secret chapel employed by the devil worshippers. The top of the well, alleged to be the deepest in England, 
said Sir Lionel, is among a tangle of weeds close by the ruined tower. Smith, ascending three stone steps, swung the lantern out over the yawning pit below. Then he stared long and fixedly upwards. Both thunder and rain had ceased, but even in those gloomy depths we could hear the coming of the tempest which followed upon that memorable storm. "'The steps are here,' reported Smith, "'but without the aid of a rope from above I doubt that they are climbable. "'It's that or the way we came, sir,' said Kennedy. "'I was five years at sea and windjammers. "'Let me swarm up and go for a rope to the park.' "'Can you do it?' demanded Smith. "'Come and look.' Kennedy craned from the opening, staring upward and downward, then— "'I can do it, sir,' he said quietly. Removing his boots and socks, he swung himself out from the opening into the well, and was gone. The story of Fu Manchu, and of the organization called the Sea Fan which he employed as a mean to further his own vast projects, is almost told. Kennedy accomplished the perilous climb to the lip of the well, and sped barefooted to Greywater Park for ropes. By means of these we all escaped from the strange chapel of the devil worshippers. Of how we arranged for the removal of the bodies which lay in the place I need not write. My record advances twenty-four hours. The great storm which burst over England in the never-to-be-forgotten spring when Fu Manchu fled our shores has become historical. There were no fewer than twenty shipwrecks during the day and night that it raged. Imprisoned by the elements in Greywater Park, we listened to the wind howling with the voice of a million demons around the ancient manor, to the creatures of Sir Lionel's collection swelling the unholy discord. Then came the news that there was a big steamer on the Pinion Rocks, that the lifeboat could not reach her. As though it were but yesterday I can see us, Sir Lionel Barton, Nayland Smith and I, hurrying down into the little cove which sheltered the fishing village, fighting our way against the power of the tempest. Thrice we saw the rocket split the inky curtain of the storm. Thrice saw the gallant lifeboat crew essay to put their frail craft out to sea, Thrice the mighty rollers hurled them contemptuously back. Dawn, a grey eerie dawn, was creeping ghostly over the iron-bound shore, when fragments of wreckage began to drift in. Such are the currents upon those coasts that bodies are rarely recovered from wrecks on the cruel pinion rocks. In the dim light I bent over a battered and torn mass of timber that once had been the bow of a boat, and in letters of black and gold I read, S. Y. Chanak Campo End of chapter 40 End of The Hand of Fu Manchu by Sax Romer